I'm Carl Johengen, Director of Music Ministry at Asbury First. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this video, an insider's view of the illuminated lessons and carols, which you'll experience as part of the live stream worship on Sunday, December 13th. My partner in planning this service is Lucy Durkin, who in addition to teaching art history and art appreciation at the Eastman School of Music and the Memorial Art Gallery, has been the driving force behind Asbury First's envisioning the passion Good Friday services over the past 25 years. We are so grateful to Lucy for generously sharing her vast knowledge of and passion for art on sacred themes. I hope you enjoy this presentation in which Lucy will share her perspective as curator and that it will enhance your experience of the illuminated lessons and carols. Please be sure to tune in on Sunday, December 13th at 11 o'clock or visit asburyfirst.org to access our worship archive. Thank you, Carl. My name is Lucy Durkin, and together with Carl and Stephen, I've selected and designed the presentation of the images you'll see in the Sunday service on December 13th. The 73 images in the service offer lots of different things to enjoy. They span 1,500 years from the 6th century to the present, they represent 18 nationalities plus one from outer space. They can be found all over the world, from here in Rochester to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and from Paris to Seoul, Korea. And they show lots of different media, from enamel plaques to a carved cameo gem, a tapestry, ceramics, sculpture, prints, and of course, paintings. And while I wish I could talk about all of them, I want to highlight a few of the images that are particularly interesting and want to call your attention to some themes that run through the presentation. The first two images are actually quite atypical for 21st century observers. The first one, it became our cover or almost our theme image of the Christ child knocking at the door of the believer's heart, which is an engraving from about 1600. It's actually one of a set of at least two dozen different depictions of the Christ child and how he conquers, guards, and defends the believer's heart. As I said, they're not common images in our world today, but were very, very popular in the 17th century. The opening lesson, a reading from Isaiah's prophecy, begins, a shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. To go with this, the next image is, again, not one that's familiar to us in the 21st century, the Jesse tree. This painting shows Jesse here down at the bottom and a tree growing out of the root of Jesse's body, quite literally depicting Christ's family tree up to the top with the Virgin and Jesus. This is also a fairly common subject in stained glass windows and illuminated manuscripts in the medieval period, but it's less common to us today. The prophecy continues on to describe the world at peace, and is, as do two paintings by artists who were largely self-taught, Edward Hicks and Horace Pippin. Hicks was a sign painter and Quaker preacher who painted over a hundred versions of the peaceable kingdom between 1820 and 1848. The theme of peace was particularly significant for the Quakers, of course, and in the left background over here is a tiny rendition of William Penn, himself an early Quaker, signing a peace treaty with Native Americans. Horace Pippin started painting as a form of occupational therapy after he was wounded in the shoulder in World War I. He painted four versions of Holy Mountain. This one happens to be the first. The central shepherd over here may be a self-portrait of Pippin himself. In contrast to the peaceful scene in the front, however, in the background you can see soldiers here lurking by a military graveyard back there. The date inscribed on the painting, June 6th, 1944, refers to D-Day, the Allied invasion at Normandy, which contrasts, reinforces the contrast between war and peace even more intensely. 
In the Lilting Carol, People Look East, we set up contrasts between images of things from our world, our memories of people sharing a meal in Asbury Dining Center, or one particular variety of flowers, hellebores, known as Christmas roses, blooming through the snow. Many Rochester gardeners have seen this. And we juxtapose them with the characterizations of Jesus himself in each verse, when he appears first as the guest, the rose, the bird, the star, and love itself. It's a wonderful carol. I hope you'll sing along. Henry Osawa Tanner's luminous annunciation is perhaps my personal favorite among the thousands of images of this subject through the centuries and among the many wonderful works this artist painted in the decades surrounding the turn of the 20th century. Tanner was the son of an African Methodist Episcopal Bishop and he valued authenticity in his biblical scenes. He went to what was then called the Holy Land just two years before he painted this scene to see the sights for himself. He put Mary into a simple dwelling that you might see in Nazareth. What makes this more special is not just the fidelity to the setting, but to the emotional authenticity of the encounter between this heavenly being who is, has no form, no wings, no halo, just pure and luminous light. And the young woman who is just beginning to grasp that her life has been inalterably transformed. Somehow I don't hear actual words being exchanged in Tanner's space. To me, this is a silent communication between two pure spirits. This painting makes the astounding courage of Mary's response, here am I, the servant of the Lord, compellingly real, immediate, and somehow entirely natural. Tanner is one of several Black American artists whose work you'll see. We saw Horace Pippins moving Holy Mountain One earlier, and there also are works by uh, Ramari Bearden, who in 1941 painted this quiet and introspective visitation scene when Mary meets her cousin Elizabeth, who is pregnant with John the Baptist, or Clementine Hunter, uh, another self-taught artist like Horace Pippin, known uh, not only for her depiction of biblical scenes, but for works which captured the realities of Black Southern life in the 20th century. You've also seen a work by Alan Rowan Kreit, whose exquisite woodcut of the Holy Family in Repose closes the carol, People Look East. This was printed on white paper with black ink, then hand colored and gilded with thin gold leaf applied to the background in order to make it glow with heavenly light. Several of the images present what you could call prequels or foreshadowings as part of other scenes. One of these is the Annunciation with the Fall of Man by Fra Angelico. Once you look past the gorgeously colored virgin and the angel, and by the way, that vivid blue paint is called ultramarine. It's made from the powdered mineral lazurite, which is found in lapis lazuli. And at the time, it was more expensive than gold. But look over on the left, and you'll see Adam and Eve being expelled from the Garden of Eden. And above them, you see God's hands up here launching the dove of the Holy Spirit, which is coming down the rays of light um, to represent the incarnation of Christ to redeem the original sin of Adam and Eve. Another Annunciation, which links two separate events together, is Nguyen Ding Dang's painting from 2000 which presents not only the Annunciation, but a haunting and surrealistic foreshadowing of the crucifixion. 
Now, not only is this artist a talented painter, he's a nuclear physicist by profession. He was born in North Vietnam, educated in Moscow and Paris, and is now working in Japan. Contrast his modern work with this 15th century image attributed to Benedetto Bonfili, and you'll see how all of the tradition of linking episodes across time is. Over 500 years separate the paintings, yet the message is so clear that while we're in the midst of joyful celebrations, Christmas means so much more because of the Good Friday and Easter to come. You may find some of the images startlingly modern, such as John Collier's Annunciation, which was commissioned for St. Gabriel's Catholic Church in McKinney, Texas in 2010. If we can imagine Mary in a room in Nazareth or in a Gothic cathedral, why is it hard to see her as a 1950s schoolgirl in a blue dress, bobby socks, and saddle shoes? Some people also were startled by the appearance of the angel as distinctly masculine. Actually, the original tradition was that angels had no gender at all, and more feminine images of angels uh, started becoming much more popular in the 18th century. The archangels in particular were often depicted uh, as distinctly masculine as warriors. Here's the archangel Michael in particular um, with a sword or a lance in his hand battling Satan. There's so much to unpack in this image that I could have spent my whole time on this one alone. It's a glorious explosion of color and detail that measures approximately three feet high by just over one foot, 14 inches wide. It was probably the left wing of a three-part altarpiece, the remainder of which is now lost, meaning that what we're looking at today was not meant to be seen on its own. Imagine the richness and complexity of the original whole. This is a classic example of an artist incorporating a visual language of symbols into an image. Many of these symbols would have been instantly recognizable, whereas others are less well known and really challenge the viewer to puzzle it all together. The most common icon in Annunciation scenes is the stalk of lilies, which represents the purity of the Virgin Mary. It's sometimes carried by the angel, sometimes it's in a vase, as you have in the image here in the lower right foreground. If you put all the details together, you come to the conclusion that the message of this painting is really the relationship of the Old Testament to the New. According to scholars, the structure of the church itself can be interpreted symbolically. The dark upper story with its older style rounded Romanesque arches and its single stained glass window of Jehovah flanked by scenes from the life of Moses refers to the former area era of the Old Testament, which is being surpassed here in the moment of the Annunciation. The lower part of the building is in the newer Gothic style with pointed arches. It's already illuminated by transparent triple windows representing the Trinity, which refers to the era of grace of the New Testament, supplanting the Old. The floor tiles depict Old Testament stories that many believed foreshadowed Christ. Two in particular, down here, uh, David beheading Goliath, closest to the bottom edge, and above, Samson destroying the Philistine temple, are both Old Testament events which prefigure the salvation of humankind through the coming of Christ. The red upholstered footstool likely refers to Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. The rich brocade of the angel's robes with the luxuriant cloth of gold and exquisitely detailed gems testifies to the importance of the textile and gem cutting trades in the region where this image was painted in Northern Europe. It was then called Flanders and is modern day Belgium. Seven golden rays stream in the window from the upper left. Each ray represents one of the traditional gifts of the spirit, wisdom, 
understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. A dove descends on the longest ray, representing the Holy Spirit that overshadowed Mary, causing the incarnation of Christ. And finally, the words that the angel speaks in Latin, Ave, Grazia Plena, Hail Mary, full of grace, um, are abbreviated and written so that we can clearly read them. A, V, E, G, R, A, and the little squiggle above means it's been abbreviated. P, L, E, N, A. Easy to read. However, the response of the Virgin Mary, also in Latin, H, A, Ancilla Domini, um, here I am, the servant of the Lord, is written E-C-C-E-A-N-C-I-L-L-A-D-N-I. -L -L There's our squiggle indicating that it has been abbreviated. H-A Ancilla Domini is written upside down and backwards because it's God from above who needs to read her response. In the story of the visitation between Mary and Elizabeth, the gospel says that the baby leapt in Elizabeth's womb upon hearing Mary's voice. Three of the images in the visitation story and in the Magnificat which follows actually show the babies leaping, as you see here. Keep your eyes out for them. This image of Mary and Elizabeth is one of the most haunting and evocative ones I've ever seen. Kette Kolwitz was one of the most skilled printmakers of the 20th century. An ardent pacifist, she lived with her physician husband who served in the poorest areas of Berlin. And her works reflect her keen awareness of the toll of poverty and the injustices of war. Her images, particularly of women and their children, show not just her personal pain. She lost one son in World War I and a grandson in World War II, but they reach beyond her own sorrow and transcend to a universal kind of level that is truly remarkable. This tiny gem, quite literally, is a cameo. It measures approximately one and a quarter by two and a half inches wide, and it's a half an inch deep. It's carved from a stone called onyx, which is a variety of quartz, which has layers and bands of different colors. If you look away from it and at the thumbnail of me for a moment, I'm holding up a picture of the cameo printed to scale. Now imagine we could lay this cameo down flat. I wish I could, it's in the collection of the Queen of England, um, so I didn't have access to do that for us. But imagine um, that it is a stone as it was originally with layers of different color. Here's a more modern cameo. Most people think that the white was carved out of one stone and somehow attached to the black of the background. This actually isn't the case. This is one stone carved together. Now, when you look at our Magi cameo, you'll see that there are actually about five different layers of colors which starts at the very top with a dark translucent amber, then a lighter translucent amber, then a slightly chalkier white and gray, and then the black, which is the background. What this means is that the artist who carved this worked from the top layer down. So he worked from the dark, there's Kaspar's face, to the next layer of darker heading towards the lighter amber, carving the areas first and then the next layer and so on down, essentially working backwards to reach the black background. Remember this is only a half an inch deep, which is about the distance from the base of your thumbnail to the tip of your thumb. Imagine the patience, devotion and skill needed to create such a tiny treasure. Last but not least, after voyaging all around the world, let's bring it close to home. 
Three of the objects in the presentation are on view at the Memorial Art Gallery on University Avenue, less than a mile away from Asbury. The collection houses art from the ancient times to the present, and visiting the tr museum is a truly lovely way to find solace for the human soul. These three are all in the upstairs galleries, which house the medieval and Renaissance objects. The keystone is roughly carved, um, but beautifully designed to be in an arch at somewhere above your head, at the center of one of these uh, vaults. Probably not terribly high given its size, which is only about 14 inches, but this was the best schematic I could find of a keystone in the vault. When you look at it, you find the angel here on the right, the Virgin Mary here, but you might also notice the hand of God launching the dove at the top left above the Virgin, as we also saw in Fra Angelico's Annunciation with the Fall of Man. The enamel triptych is brilliantly colored and seems to glow with an inner light. The main panel is the scene of the nativity. Um, the two wings show the Annunciation with Gabriel on the left and the Virgin Mary on the right. And here, when you look at it in its full frame, you can see what it looks like and what it looks like when the wings are folded closed, either for protection or to make it more easily transportable. The Italian marble relief of the Virgin and Child shows not just Mary and the baby Jesus, but look what he's holding, of course, the tiny dove. And as the Carol People Looks East tells us, love the bird is on the way. Finally, it was so fun to bring this all the way home to Asbury itself through the photograph of last year's Christmas pageant. I know Paula has lots of plans for how to create a different but still wonderful experience for everyone this year. I hope you've enjoyed this preview and will find comfort, excitement, and joy in the service itself. Many thanks go to Sarah Brubaker and the Stellar Tech team who have made so much possible. And of course, Carl, Dwayne, the singers, and Stephen. It's been a true privilege to work with everyone in putting this all together. We all hope that you will see something that makes your heart sing. Thank you.